Welcome, everyone. My name is Cesar Rodriguez Veravito. I'm the co-director of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice at NYU School of Law and the director of the Climate Litigation Accelerator, which is hosting this webinar on key cases, key, key recent cases in Brazil that we'll be discussing first uh, in the public panel. And then for those of you who are members of the community of practice of the Climate Litigation Accelerator, uh, we ask that you please use a different link uh, that was sent to you in the email invite to join the second uh, half of the meeting at uh, 45 past the hour. Briefly, because we um, uh, have the privilege of having a very knowledgeable uh, facilitator for today, uh, Caio Borges, uh, our colleague uh, from the Institute for Climate and Society in Brazil will be moderating the, the panel today. He's been an active member of CLX's community of practice. Uh, I'll just say a couple of things about uh, this event before turning it over to Caio. So about three years ago, I had the opportunity of participating in a meeting convened by the University of Sao Paulo, Conectas, and other organizations that were trying to bring together a coalition of actors to start to file a climate case in Brazil. That's uh, just like in everything else having to do with social justice and human rights in Brazil. It, it is a pretty vibrant scene. And uh, this coalition and other organizations discussed different avenues to bring a case before uh, the Brazilian courts on the poor record on deforestation and the worrying trends in the Amazon. And that was uh, before Bolsonaro. When uh, Bolsonaro came to power, of course, all of these issues having to do with the fires in the Amazon and the, and the uh, serious deterioration of life conditions for indigenous peoples and other uh, traditional communities in the Amazon became even more urgent. And that is why it is uh, very exciting and encouraging to see that after all those preparatory discussions, uh, several cases have been filed uh, that deal precisely with deforestation, with the financing of action against uh, the deterioration of the Amazon, which as we all know, is a key ecosystem without which there is no chance that the uh, planet will stay under any non-catastrophic scenarios for the uh, climate system. So today, and with this, I'll turn it over to Caio, we'll be discussing the two key cases before the Supreme Court of Brazil, but also other avenues that are being tried and may be tried uh, to uh, tackle deforestation and uh, source other sources of global warming coming out of the Amazon uh, uh, ecosystem. So with that, Caio, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Cesar, and um, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be moderating this session on the Brazilian cases. Um, I will be, I'll just say uh, two things in this short introduction. The first is to give a very brief overview about these two uh, cases that are now pending before the Brazilian Supreme Court. And then I will introduce our speakers and then each of them will have um, five minutes for their introductory remarks and then we'll go to the Q&A. So as Cesar just mentioned, um, Brazil is now seeing a, a new wave of climate uh, litigation cases. And two of these important cases, they have been filed directly with the Supreme Court, which are the um, Amazon Fund and the Climate uh, Fund cases. And both these cases, they relate to uh, financial instruments of climate policy. So the Climate Fund is a, a public fund that finances mitigation and adaptation measures. And um, the Amazon Fund is a bilateral uh, cooperation fund um, that finances uh, many activities um, uh, directed at the conservation of the Amazon. And in the last year and a half, both uh, funds, uh, they have been stalled. Uh, there has been no allocation or disbursement of these funds and also the governance bodies, they have been deactivated. So uh, these two cases both have been brought by four political parties in Brazil, uh, which have standing uh, before the Supreme Court. And uh, the political parties, they basically require that the Supreme Court uh, orders the government uh, to resume uh, the funds that are already um, um, 
within these this two uh, instruments and also to uh, reactivate uh, the governance bodies such as um, intersectorial committees uh, that define the policies of the funds and also technical departments within these two funds. So these two cases, they are very important because they basically open a new chapter in the history of Brazilian uh, climate litigation. Uh, we understand them as both being uh, direct climate litigation because they deal directly with climate policies. Uh, they are the first two climate cases that have reached the Brazilian Supreme Court. They're also important because in both cases, the Supreme Court has called public hearings um, that um, uh, in which uh, many actors have participated. We have seen CSOs, business people, the scientific community, the government uh, attending and presenting directly at the Supreme Court the reasons. Um, and also, uh, I think it's important because these cases, they are paving the way for the Supreme Court to rule on a much broader issue, which is the government failure to implement um, policies uh, to safeguard the stability of the climate system and also to protect the Amazon as a carbon sink. And it's always useful to remind that the Amazon is a constitutionally protected uh, biome in, uh, according to Brazilian constitution. Um, so our speakers, they will be uh, uh, giving us a little bit of um, a sense of how they have been involved with these cases but also how they are doing um, uh, work related uh, to the Amazon as well. So in addition to these two cases, we are seeing uh, uh, some cases that are being presented directly with the Brazilian courts, also seeking to hold the government accountable for the failure to implement Brazilian climate uh, policies and goals. And this is what they will be speaking on. So our three speakers, I, I think it, it's, uh, I'm really thrilled to have these three speakers because I wanted to show the diversity of the landscape of climate litigation in Brazil. So we have different actors here that will be sharing their views. First, we have Sueli Araujo. She's a senior advisor with the Observatório do Clima, a major Brazilian uh, network of climate NGOs. She's also the former head of the Brazilian Federal Environmental Agency, which is basically the Brazilian EPA. Um, and then we're gonna have Ana Carolina. Ana Carolina, she's a federal prosecutor in the state of the Amazon, Amazonas. And she's also uh, the coordinator of the workforce um, um, of the Amazon within the federal prosecutors. And then finally, we're gonna have Delton. Delton, uh, he's an attorney and also a professor at Unicinos in, in the south of Brazil. And he's specialized in environmental law, disaster law and climate law. So with no further ado, I'd like to invite Sueli to uh, give her first remarks. Thank you, Sueli. Okay. Are you here? It's okay. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I've been working with these uh, two litigation cases uh, since uh, their beginnings. Uh, I I have uh, I wrote the technical notes that are in the that uh, start the process of these uh, two cases of litigation. But I, I, I want to highlight uh, the, the situation of uh, Brazilian environmental policy. Uh, uh, th this hard situation is the, uh, the basis, the base of the, the increase of the number of litigations related to environmental policy. Uh, the, the Bolsonaro government has been responsible, responsible uh, for permanent attacks on Brazilian environmental policy. They fail to comply, they relax laws, they disorganize environmental governance, they destroy achievements. Uh, An anti-environmental policy is underway, it must be understood. And the option uh, in terms of environmental policy nowadays is to do nothing by the government. Because of this situation, the Observatório do Clima uh, started to work with the elaboration of proposals for a set of judicial actions, uh, uh, which have be, has been, been signed by or formalized by political parties or by other NGOs. Uh, the first one the, the, that I, I want to highlight is the one related to the Amazon fund. There are uh, more than two 
2.9 billion reais standing in this fund without investment in new projects since January uh, uh, of the last year. The Minister of the Environment does not accept to spend resources for projects of NGOs and therefore paralyze the Amazon fund by extinguishing its steering uh, committee. Uh, the government itself was harmed because the fund also finances projects fund from the federal government and state government, governments. Uh, this is very unacceptable uh, to have this amount of money without being used uh, to environmental policy. It's really, in my opinion, it's really a crime. Uh, the second uh, lawsuit in the Supreme Court is the one that requests the resumption of the government transfers to the Climate Fund. Uh, the Bolsonaro government spent a year and a half without providing resources to this fund without any justification. Even without the final decision in this case of the uh, Climate Fund, uh, the government recent, uh, recently made the, uh, the transfers of this year. We are on the alert, uh, however, because it seems that the government intends to apply the resources in a biased manner without observing priorities consistently with our greenhouse gas emission uh, situation. Uh, we have uh, a third uh, litigation case in the Supreme Court related uh, to the administrative, administrative process that judged the environmental fines applied by the environmental agencies. This uh, process has been completely paralyzed for about uh, a year, uh, alleging uh, operation, operational uh, uh, problems with a new stage of conciliation that the government itself created. With this, the performance of the environmental inspections is complete, uh, completely weakened. They are paralyzed. The judging of the administrative uh, process are also paralyzed. Uh, and then uh, uh, by the Observatório do Clima, these, are, uh, these three cases are the most important uh, ones, ones in, uh, but we have other uh, uh, cases in, that are being processed uh, in other courts. That's all uh, in the beginning, for the beginning, it's all. Uh, I'm sorry if I my paralyzed English. <laughs> no worries, it's very understandable, um, Sueli. And thank you for providing additional detail on the two cases. Uh, what has happened since last year with the uh, Amazon Fund and the Climate Fund. And also, I think you highlighted again uh, this diversity of the Brazilian landscape of climate litigation. Uh, when you mentioned that there, there has been a collaboration between the Observatório do Clima, this network of NGOs, and the political parties to bring this action, which I think is very um, interesting to, to watch and to discuss. So next, let's move then to Ana Carolina uh, from the Federal Prosecution Service in Brazil. She's also going to um, uh, give us a little bit of a sense of what the prosecution uh, service has been doing in this area of climate litigation. Thank you, Caio. I would like to start uh, thank you, thanking you and Professor Cesar for the invitation. It's a really honor to be here uh, talking about what we're doing in the Federal Prosecution Service. So in the beginning of the year 2020, deforestation rates in the Amazon kept growing in spite of the rainy season when usually illegal loggers are not in the field. The Federal Prosecution Service had been supervising the trends concerning deforestation rates in the Amazon since 2019 uh, due to the previous fire crisis. An investigation had been started by then, and we wanted to know how the federal government was going to deal with crescent deforestation rates and how it would lead the deforestation tackling policy. When COVID-19 pandemics hit the country, we asked governmental agencies what would they do to assure environmental inspections to keep working. At that time, on late February, 
we still hope that the pandemics would remove illegal loggers from deepening their activities in the forest, but that was not the case. And in March, the official deforestation rate was still increasing. We had had access to documents from the official federal uh, environmental agency identifying the most critical areas in the Amazon regarding deforestation and other illegal activities, such as illegal gold mining. There were 10 hotspots already mapped, and there was a plan to keep inspection teams working on all of the hotspots. Nevertheless, the pandemic crushed the official planning and the, and the environmental minister declared on Facebook that inspection teams were retreating from the field due to the COVID-19 risks. That was a sign for us. We should take immediate action since the association between the pandemics, the illegal deforestation and governmental absence would be deadly, not only to the Amazon itself, but also to its traditional populations such as indigenous people, nut collectors, fisher villages, and so on. On April, so we presented our case before a federal court in Manaus, the capital of the state of Amazonas. We asked the court to determine the immediate implementation of inspections in all of the 10 hotspots which have been mapped by the Brazilian Environmental Agency during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our arguments were centered on constitutional duties to preserve the forest and the traditional communities it sheltered. But we also stressed the impact that deforestation rates had over the Brazilian commitments regarding climate change. Actually, land use changes respond for 44% of all Brazilian greenhouse gases emissions and are basically related to deforestation. This means that there is no real option of tackling climate changes in Brazil without a serious approach to the illegal logging problem in the Amazon and also in other biomes such as the Cerrado. We showed the court how Brazil was uh, heading away from its own goals concerning deforestation. The National Climate Change Policy stated that deforestation rates in the Amazon should be no higher than 3,925 square kilometers in 2020 and we will probably beat 13,000 uh, square kilometers this year. Uh, we also highlighted how deforestation implied immediate impact on human rights, uh, such as the rights of indigenous communities uh, uh, to their territories and natural resources, as well as to health once they were being menaced by COVID-19 vectors, namely the environmental offenders which were working in the forest. Furthermore, uh, there were health issues for the whole Amazonian population, which was suffering from the fires and their hazardous smoke. We also mentioned the risks of uh, hydric crisis posed by deforestation all over South America related to the role the forest plays in providing rain everywhere. And finally, deforestation itself was a greenhouse gas emission source contributing to climate change everywhere in the world and to the impacts the phenomenon has on human rights. Initially, the federal court accepted the case and issued an order determining inspection services to be kept in all of the 10 hotspots. It also determined the, formula the formulation of a plan protecting the forest and its people. Nevertheless, the government, government appealed and the federal court of appeal lifted the initial order. We appealed ourselves and we also tried to conciliate fostering a plan building approach. The Court of Appeal unhappily did not respond to our demands. Even so, we keep administratively supervising the deforestation policy aiming at understanding governmental planning in that regard and at encouraging ambition when it comes to illegal logging tackling. Uh, we feel climate change arguments strengthen the environmental agenda in the Amazon and might sensitize judges of how rigorous we should be in addressing deforestation in courts. So that's uh, my first comments on one of our most important cases. And I, I'm completely uh, available to address any other um, doubts that might appear. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Anna, for uh, leading us through this amazing case that connects the um, environmental agenda with the public health issue of the COVID-19 
and how the government is also uh, failing to protect uh, the forests and the traditional communities within the Amazon in the context of this pandemic and how the pandemic has been affecting some public uh, policies. So our final speaker, Delton Cavallo, uh, uh, will also provide us with an overview of also another very interesting case that has just been brought that uh, challenges the failure of the government to implement the domestic goals of our climate uh, policy. So Delton, you, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank Professor Cesar Garavito and Caio Borges for the invitation. It's a great honor to attend this event at the NYU and its Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. As we all know here, carbon emissions in Brazil are strongly associated with deforestation to convert natural forests into farmland and pastures. Unfortunately, deforestation rates in Brazil have trended upward since 2012 when we had a total deforested area of 4,571 square kilometers. This figure surged to 10,129 square kilometers in 2019. According to the statutory target established by Brazilian legislation, in 2020, that area should be just under 4,000 square kilometers. But there is no reason to believe Brazil will meet this target. We have brought a public interest civil action against the federal government to address this issue. The plaintiff is the Institute of Amazonian Studies. This public interest civil action was filed on October 8th at the Federal Court of Curitiba and counts with Professor Carlos Nobre's scientific support as our expert witness. This is a science supported lawsuit. Our main strategy was to avoid pointless discussions concerning the binding force of the Paris Agreement and instead to use our domestic climate change legislation. So we framed a straightforward climate lawsuit. The Brazilian emission target is a federal statutory commitment set out in the Climate Change National Policy Act. It is worth mentioning that this legislation promulgated before the Paris Agreement was made by Brazilian legislators and there is no dispute on its binding legal nature. In order to meet this target, the federal government has issued a decree setting out very specific action plans for preventing and controlling deforestation in various Brazilian biomes, as well as outlining sectoral plans for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Among these is the action plan for prevention and control of deforestation in legal Amazon what we call PPCDM. Our goal is to make the Brazilian federal government take adequate measures to comply with our climate change national policy and thereby to enforce the PPCDM. This is what we expect from the lawsuit. Our claim is based on the fundamental right to a stable climate for present and future generations. We expect this right to be recognized. We seek an order for the federal government to comply with its own policy. We seek an order for the federal government to reforest an area equivalent to what was deforested beyond the statutory limit. We seek an order for the defendant to allocate sufficient budgetary resources for this purpose, as well as use all the funding available for this task. The reason why we decided to pursue this climate case is simply because the government deforestation targets are not going to be met and the defendant is not taking any measures to comply with the law and the mitigation plan. What has happened so far? The court has made a few formal requirements, but has clearly demonstrated its intention to hear the case. The court requirements will be fully met by the plaintiff. We also indicated the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research as friend of the court. What are the next steps? After being notified, the defendant will present its defense. As is usual in Brazil, this might take some time. Thank you very much for your invitation. If you have uh, further questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delton. Um, thank you very much. This is also another um, really important case. 
I would like first to congratulate the three of you for being uh, uh, brave and um, actively uh, using uh, legal strategies uh, to push back these environmental rollbacks from the government and also to push for more ambition. I think it's clear for us now how uh, these three cases, although they are very much interrelated and they have a common objective of holding the government accountable for their failure to implement uh, the, the, the Brazilian uh, domestic and international goals, it's really interesting to see that they have been shaped through different legal uh, strategies, uh, just as Sueli said, having a technical study uh, to support the case uh, with the Supreme Court. And then Ana Carolina, she mentioned that there was an investigation by the prosecutors uh, before seeking to have the courts uh, ordering the government to implement uh, public policies. And now Delton has also highlighted the role of science um, in, in bringing this case that um, is challenging the failure of the government to implement its own uh, climate goals. So I think Cesar, we now, can I now take the questions? Yeah, there is, uh, there's a, a number of questions and we have limited time. Uh, so I wanted to first congratulate all the speakers on their use of the time and Caio uh, pulling off a very good uh, use of uh, the collective time as well. In the interest of having all of you react quickly uh, to uh, the questions, I thought that I would cluster them in three um, sets and quickly send back each uh, one cluster to each of you. So for Ana Carolina, um, it, you know, the, the uniqueness and the importance of the prosecutor's office of the Ministerio Público may be lost to some uh, attendees who are not familiar with uh, how competent, how, how um, internally compact and, and, and professional, and also how independent the prosecutor's office is and how much capacity it has in actually monitoring what happens in the Amazon. So Ana Carolina, for uh, uh, everyone, she's based in Manaus, which is a major city in the Amazon region. And uh, the question to you, uh, Ana Carolina, is you gave us all this uh, important numbers about both the uh, the worrying trends of deforestation and also the lack of enforcement of policy against deforestation. And then you mentioned the um, litigation efforts being made by the prosecutor's office. From past experience, um, and we at CLX have had some experience, for example, following previous rounds of litigation, say of the uh, Belo Monte Dam uh, back in mid 2010s that went all the way up to at some point to the highest courts and would be uh, struck down you know overnight Pro progress that was made at lower courts never really made it all the way up to the supreme court or were struck down in the uh, in reversed in, in the process because of the structure of the brazilian um, and, uh, judicial system and also the particularities of procedural um, uh, rules. So in this particular set of cases, are you and the Ministerio Publico um, hopeful that this won't happen, that the, all the, your efforts won't be reversed at the level of the courts because of that tradition of, 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 of the Brazilian uh, procedural system? And then for Delton, thanks for uh, sharing with us that really exciting, important case. There's a number of questions about different angles to litigation. They were not directly addressed to you, but I thought that because of the uh, multifaceted uh, nature of your case, I would uh, raise them and ask you to quickly address them. So one thing that we're doing through this series of webinars is international cross-fertilization and cross-learning, right? The, this community of practice and this space facilitated by CLX is all about trying to figure out what we can learn from uh, efforts in one country that can be applied in other countries. So I'm sure that attendees, participants are taking active notes of your strategies and will uh, we'll, uh, look forward to have more information about your cases so that they can also use some of these strategies in their own, in their own uh, jurisdictions. You mentioned at least 
three strategies. I'll just put it on the table. I won't elaborate on any of them, and but ask you to elaborate on some of those. You said that you're using a, a national legal framework to circumvent all the complications having to do with the potential objection to the legal uh, nature and the bound uh, and the binding nature of the Paris Agreement in in in, um, in Brazil. You mentioned uh, the use of science and the application of science. You know, Carlos Nobre is the, the foremost scientist in the uh, of the uh, Amazon climate system. And then you alluded to something that some of the participants wanted to hear more about, which is potentially the use of human rights um, uh, grounds and arguments, and of course, constitutional provisions. And so the question is, did on the latter on human rights, is that part of the of the argument? And second, in choosing to pursue um, and to apply a national framework and to squarely use science, did you uh, take a page from any other litigation going on in other places in the world? And finally, to Sueli, uh, there's a number of questions about the two cases. Uh, some of them have to do with the facts and the arguments and, and then the proceedings. Of course, there have been two very active rounds of hearings um, and many of the people here have participated in those hearings. And also, for example, in the first hearing, uh, there was a very important intervention by the UN Rapporteur on uh, the environment and human rights who also submitted a brief to the court. So this already has international repercussions and resonance. Okay, so the question to Sueli, well, Sueli kindly uh, shared with us the links to the websites where the Supreme Court is sharing all the materials. So Lauren will kindly share those, those to all of the audience. But to Sueli, the question is, based on those facts, uh, what's the expectation about the Supreme Court ruling, uh, rulings? What would you expect them to say in their rulings? And what type of monitoring mechanism would you would you um, want to see them uh, putting in place. Okay, so let's go in the same order that we, so, and of course, Caio, if you if you wanna chip in at the end and, and wrap it up, uh, please do so. So, uh, Ana Carolina, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Professor, for your, your question. So, uh, Brazilian appeal system is quite complicated and it implies um, uh, different, uh, grades of revision when uh, of uh, decisions taken in the for the for, for the singular judge so we're quite uh, optimist about decisions um which are taken by our singular judges in federal courts but not so optimistic about decisions taken in the first court of appeal which was in our case the court which suspended uh, the order that we had firstly obtained. In this case, we feel that we should uh, keep pressing uh, the courts of appeal in order to present them the arguments concerning climate change and human rights, it just, and to sensitize them uh, to this. Um, it's a new theme, it's a new grounds for them. So they're not um, completely aware or completely um, understanding maybe of uh, of the implications of uh, this, of all, all of the phenomena in, um, in human rights protection. Uh, on the other hand, we also feel that taking these cases to what I would call a second court of appeal, which, uh, which is our Superior Tribunal de Justiça, and also to this Supreme Court is very important because judges in, this, in these two different courts, the Supreme Court and our second court of appeal, they tend to be more um, sensitized to this kind of uh, strategic litigation cases. Uh, so uh, what I think we should do as, uh, as federal prosecutors is keep pressing and keep uh, bringing these arguments before all courts in order to make them to, to force the courts to get to know them to get in touch with the theme and to study the theme and and to be completely aware of all the implications climate change has on human rights uh protection um well and i would also like to point out that even uh it's quite complicated when it comes to strategic litigation 
things that are uh, sometimes political uh, political inter uh, interferences, which might uh, uh, which might induce judges uh, in the courts of appeal uh, to uh, suspend orders, which were taken in the first uh, in the first degree. There is already a movement in non-strategic cases or on day-to-day -day cases to treat environmental offenders harder. And this is already uh, an answer to the environmental crisis we're facing since uh, 2019. Uh, so what we need to do now is to take this, uh, this movement of uh, making the treatment of illegal offenders harder and take it to the, our strategic cases as well. Thank you, uh, Anna Carolina. Uh, Delton, you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Thank you for your question, Professor Cesar Garavito. Uh, first, the main cases, uh, we've been working through this case for the last two years. And the main cases, or at least the cases that influenced me the most, were the Colombian and the future generation uh, case. Uh, Massachusetts versus EPA, uh, the Juliana case, and the Urgenda case as well. Because all of these cases have in common a constitutional basis, and at the same time, they demonstrate how uh, climate change can put in danger uh, day by day and uh, common activities in day by day lifestyle and economy and all our activities we have uh, in a society. Uh, using the national or our domestic uh, law system, it seemed very important to avoid the debate about the binding force of a Paris Agreement once our courts are, just like Anna said, our courts are just getting um, introduced to this kind of litigation. So I thought it was very important to use our domestic legislation, which is very clear about uh, avoiding deforestation and sets numbers and rates in a perfect, uh, or at least in a very clear uh, rate. So uh, I thought the first generation of uh, climate litigation in Brazil, it, it seemed very important to start this debate uh, using domestic uh, legislation. At least we have uh, um, a climate change national policy act in Brazil. So it's undebatable, the, it's uh, biding force. The use of science, it's very important to avoid um, denial arguments. So we can demonstrate that our monitoring system is very efficient and our, the deforestation, you have proof, scientific proof of the deforestation and the deforestation uh, won't meet uh, our statutory target and commitment. And your uh, third point is about the human rights. Yes, we used the center of our uh, lawsuit is uh, the human dignity due to our, our constitution in Brazil is uh, its core in human rights and fundamental rights. It's based in human dignity and the entire environmental law, social rights, and even liberty rights are all linked in this idea of human dignity. So we demonstrate that the, the, the climate damages and all this climate destabilization hurt this dignity. So we uh, using our fundamental right in Brazil, which is a constitutional fundamental right of a stable uh, um, uh, environment and health environment. We use that and human dignity to demonstrate that uh, climate destabilization will hurt these fundamental rights. So we linked all of them and 
uh, we defend and we uh, want to uh, be recognized the stable climate fundamental right, which we think is an uh, intergenerational right for future and present generation in Brazil. Thank you, Mazda. Thanks so much, Delta. Much discussed there. Hopefully, we have a chance to continue the conversation. And um, Sueli and, and then Caio to wrap okay. it up. No, I just wanted to flag that we have five more minutes. Yeah. Okay, I, I try to be uh, quick. Uh, but in both actions, uh, the, the, the hardcore, the, the, the deep core of the bo these both actions, the, the, the lawsuits related to uh, the Amazon uh, fund and to the climate fund, is that the public policy must be put in practice. It's a, a legal obligation to the government, and the government is not uh, implementing this obligation. We are not discussing uh, crimes related to the environmental minister or other public agents. Uh, we are trying to put uh, 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 the things in order. We are trying to put uh, the public policy uh, in practices. Uh, we really think that we will have success in some level especially in the regarding the lawsuit related to the Amazon fund. This, this case is very strong because the amount of money parallelized is very high. And historically, uh, the money destined to environmental policy is very short. Uh, and the facts show it in, this, in these cases are unacceptable. In the case of the climate fund, the problem now is to assure the Correct, correct use of the money. Uh, this is not uh, really easy because the Supreme Court uh, will have to enter in the field of deciding the use of public money. And the Supreme Court uh, uh, doesn't use it to do this kind of, uh, it's not common that the Supreme Court uh, 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 decide in this way, but we will try because uh, the minister is really showing silence that he, will, he intends to apply in, in the resources in a biased uh, uh, manner, uh, directing this money uh, to, uh, to, to uh, pl uh, plans, projects uh, related to solid waste. And the solid waste is not really an important uh, part of the Brazilian uh, picture of uh, GE uh, uh, emissions. Uh, this is a wrong way uh, to use this money. And, and uh, we will try to follow in this lawsuit, uh, cash question, uh, this use, this wrong use. But we, we, we are really um, um, happy, happy with the results until now. And uh, we, we think we have great hope that these demands will be successful. Thank you, Suemi. Caio, do you have two minutes to wrap it up? No, thank you very much once again. I see that there are questions in the Q&A, uh, especially relating, uh, many people are asking what are the panelists view on the potential outcomes of these cases. And I think Suemi has touched on this point about the government, the courts uh, like, um, how the court will uh, understand the extension of the discretion of the government. And it, I think this will be a major issue. Uh, and it has been actually in the case brought by Ana Carolina. So this is one, just one of the many, many substantive issues that we could discuss. I know uh, these cases are very um, interesting and they give us a lot of food for thought. Um, I just wanted to say that many people are also asking about the filings. Some of these cases, with the exception of uh, the case uh, that Delton is working on, they are all available in the databases of the uh, Sabin Center and the Grantham Institute. Um, we will be uh, working with these two uh, centers to uh, regularly update so that everyone that wants to learn more about these cases have access to the materials. Unfortunately, at this point, they are only in Portuguese but hopefully we will also be able to make them available in English in the future, at least the main filings, uh, the petitions and then the rulings. So if you want to have uh, access to these uh, cases, you can also uh, uh, search them in the databases. 
So Cesar, I think that's it for now. We're wrapping up this uh, really, really good discussion. I wanted to thank for everyone that attended and for those that will now uh, participate in the closed sessions, I wanted to invite everyone to, um, to click the links and then also be involved in, in the discussions in the next session. Thanks, thanks so much, Caio, and perfect timing. Uh, we are now moving for those of you who will be participating in the community of practice strategic discussion. We're moving to a different link. So you need to leave this session and open the other one with the other link you received it with the email invite. To those of you who joined us only for the public session, thanks much, stay tuned. Uh, uh, CLX is convening uh, a webinar uh, on a regular basis. Now these days it's, it's monthly, it used to be bi-monthly, but the field of climate mitigation has become so dynamic and uh, we've also received uh, requests for support to litigation going on in other places around the world. So we will be featuring an important situation in the Caribbean uh, in December uh, in the island of Antigua and Barbuda. Very fascinating, important case, a microcosm of climate action or inaction and uh, human rights violations stemming from um, climate displacement in early December. So stay tuned and thanks much again.